Well, it's good to be with you today, and we're continuing week six of our series, The Parables. By the way, how many of you enjoyed Megan Fate last weekend? Was that awesome? That was uh, very powerful, and she... She had an absolute blast here, and it's so fun when you bring in some of these speakers, and they're like, would you have me back? I'm like, let me pray about it, you know, and just, just think about it, and uh, yeah, of course, so <laughs> very, very excited, and ladies, by the way, uh, next uh, year's Echo Conference, we just confirmed that uh, Lisa Harper and Bianca are coming back uh, for Echo Conference, and we'll tell you more about that, so a lot of great things going on, men's, men's breakfast is coming up October the 12th, so looking forward to having all you, we're going to have some good food, get good fellowship, and so make sure you're registering for that. But we've been in the series, The Parables, and it's been a fun series. We spoke about the parable of the sower. We spoke about the parable of the unforgiving servant. We spoke about the good Samaritan. Uh, We spoke about the parable of the talents and the prodigal son. And so we got three more weeks left in this series, and uh, just to, to learn more about the parables of Christ. And the parables are so important because Jesus is telling stories that teach us how to live via the kingdom, how to, how to live with a kingdom perspective, a kingdom mindset, a kingdom heart set. You know, I love this story I read the other day of a Spanish athlete named Ivan Fernandez Anaya, and uh, he's a, a famous athlete, cross, cross-country runner, and he was in a race in uh, Barluda, Navarra, Spain, and uh, he was running, and he was in second place, and he was a little bit of a distance behind the front runner and kind of chasing him, and, and the runner in the front, the lead runner, was uh, Abai Matai, Abai, sorry, Abai Matai, who was from Kenya. And as they got into the finishing straight, Ivan noticed that um, Matai, the Kenyan runner, thought he had finished the race, crossed the line, but the reality is he was 10 meters short of the finishing line. Most people would have thought that Ivan would have just sped up and passed uh, Abai Matai to win the race, but he didn't. He realized that there was no way that he would actually finish the race. And so what he did is he ran up to Abai, the Kenyan runner, and he began to guide him to the finish line. Afterwards, reporters came to him and said, what did you do? You could have won the race. What were you thinking? And here's his response. He said, He was the rightful winner. He created a gap that I couldn't have closed. I didn't deserve to win it. I did what I had to do. He was the rightful winner. As soon as I saw he was stopping, I knew I wasn't going to pass him. You know, I love that honesty and I love that humility because so often in life, we're really chasing things and we're making life all about ourselves. Today's parable we're going to look at is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. We're going to look at Romans, cha- uh, sorry, Luke chapter 18, uh, verses 9 to 14. If you have your sermon notes, you can open them up on our church app right now. Make sure you hit the uh, this week and it'll refresh and you can follow with me and do the fill-ins if you want to. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. And Jesus, he, he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So here's the scenario. Jesus has a group of people that are there. They're ready to listen. He says, I'm, he's noticing that these people that he's talking to, his audience are people that think that they're righteous. And they're kind of treating others, they're kind of playing them down or not treating them in a respectful way. Treating with contempt. And so he says, let me tell you this parable. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, when we read this, you know, a lot of times you and I, we, we don't realize what's really going on in the story. Because, you know, when we hear the word Pharisee, we think immediately, well, legalistic, judgmental, critical, you know, the ones that are like the spiritual police. But in the times of Jesus right here, the, the Pharisees were the ones that people looked up to. So Jesus says, let me tell you the story about a Pharisee. And the people were like, oh, ooh, the Pharisees, this is awesome. We love the Pharisees. Why? Because they love God and they keep the rules and they teach everybody the rules and they're so spiritual and they just, I want to be more like them because they're so close to God. And he says, let me tell you about a Pharisee and a tax collector. And they're like, no, a tax collector. That's, you know, I'm disgusted. 
They betray us because tax collectors were seen as thieves or they were seen at the level of thieves and adulterers because tax collectors were Jews that worked for the Roman Empire. And what they would do is they would go collect taxes from all the Jews. So the Jews felt betrayed by these people and, and they knew that the Romans said, hey, you can take a piece of their taxes for yourself. So they were lining their pockets with their own people's money. Jesus, let me tell you the story of a Pharisee, oh yeah, and a tax collector, no, we hate them. Jesus, they went up to the temple to go and pray. Verse 11 says, and the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed, he prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. The Pharisee now, the Pharisees were expected to go to the temple and pray. They were expected to pray daily. That was the law. That was the requirement. And so it's not surprising that this Pharisee is going up to the temple and that he's, that he's going there to pray. But what he prayed was so unexpected. He begins with God. Look at my life, God. Look at how good I am, God. God, I'm better than most of these people in the room. I'm better than that tax collector over there. God, look at me. I, I, I fast twice a week and I pay my tithes. And God, I mean, come on, God. You did a great thing when you made me, God. I'm going to take a bow, God. Look at my works. Look at how, look at how good I am. It's interesting because the law required him to fast once a year, the Feast of Atonement. He makes it about God, look, God, look at me, I fast twice a week. I am like above the law, I am super Christian, I am awesome, I'm here praying God, and look at me, I'm just living right, I'm doing all the right things, look at my works, they are awesome. I, I mean, I tithe on everything I get, even the air I breathe, I give you back 10%. I mean, just look at how awesome I am. But look at the tax collector in verse 13. But the tax collector standing afar off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he beat his chest saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He's at the back. Why? Because he knew that people were looking, looking at him saying, why are you even here? You are unclean. How did you even get into the temple? You rob us of our money. You're a betrayer. You shouldn't even be here. He's in the back. And he wouldn't even lift his head up to pray. He looks to the dirt. He's, I'm not worthy to talk to you even. And he prays the short prayer, God, have mercy on me a sinner, and he repeats, he's beating, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. What's so interesting is, if you go and study the beating of a chest, there's only one other place in scripture where you'll actually see that. It's found in Luke chapter 23, verse 48. The expression of beating his chest is, is reflected in Luke chapter 3 verse 48. And you know what Luke chapter 3 verse 48 is? Luke chapter 3 verse 48 is when the men and women were beating their chest as they left the crucifixion with Jesus hanging on the cross. They were beating themselves, realizing that, yes, he was the Savior. Yes, he was the King. Yes, he said who he was, the Son of God, the Lamb of God that was slain. They were beating themselves. So, yes, this man in the temple beating himself, saying, God, beating his breast, God. And why was he beating his breast? Because really he was beating his heart. God, I'm a sinner. God, I'm not worthy. It's interesting, he also began his prayer, just like the Pharisee with the word God, but instead of making it about himself, God, the Pharisee said, look at me. Look at how great I am. I'm better than all these people in the room. I'm better than that tax collector. I, Lord, you know what, I fast twice a week, more than the law says. Lord, I tithe on everything I get. Look how great I am. He made it about himself, but the Pharisee starts with God. It's not about my works, because I know my works. I've missed your mark, God 
be merciful to me because I am a sinner. It's so interesting because the wording for merciful right there is from the Greek word halaskamai, uh, halaskamai, which basically means this, God, I need your atonement. It's actually taken, the, you'll see that, that, that halaskamai Greek, you'll see it in another passage which is found in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 17. And listen to this, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 17, for this reason he, talking about Jesus, had to be made like them, like you and I, fully human in every way, in order that he, Jesus, might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement of the sins of the people. It's tax collectors shouting up, be merciful. Halas kamai, halas kamai. What is he saying? God, I need your atonement of my sins. My sins are so great, God. There's no way that I can pay the price for my sins. God, I know that you're holy and I am not. And so, God, I need my sins to be forgiven. I need my sins to be renewed. I need atonement. Verse 14, I tell you, Jesus says, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This man humbles himself. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said he left justified. The tax collector was the one who was justified. Justify is the language of the law courts, and it's a word, if you study Paul, the theology of Paul, it's a word that is central to Paul's theology on salvation, justification. It's interesting that Jesus uses the word justified. So the first times that he says somebody left justified. If you're taking notes today, we've got four points we're going to go through. The first one is First fill in, God's grace paid the price for our salvation. God's grace paid the price for our salvation. I love how Pastor Megan said last week, it's grace upon grace upon grace. What is grace? Grace is God's unmerited favor. What does that mean? Grace is God giving us what we do not deserve. And that's the reality when it comes to salvation. You and I, we don't deserve salvation. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says the, pay, the penalty or the wages of sin is death. The word death there means eternal separation from God. But the, Romans 6 23 says, the back part says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. What is that verse saying? The verse is saying because of our sin, we're all guilty. And well, what is the judgment of sin? You know what the Bible says the judgment of sin is? Separation from God for eternity. Oh, pastor, you're talking about hell? Yeah. But why does God send people to hell? He doesn't. Sin condemns us to hell. The penalty of sin is death. God is holy. This is why this guy's crying out, be merciful, be merciful. I am a sinner. I am guilty. But God, thank you for your grace. Max Lucado, the author, says this, the meaning of life, the wasted years of life, the poor choices of life, God answers the mess of life with one word, grace. I love that. Because if we're honest today, we've all missed God's mark, right? We've all made a mess, made bad choices, said and done things we shouldn't have done. But the good news is God can take the mess of our lives and turn it into a message of redemption and hope and forgiveness. That's what he does. Grace. I want to look at a great paragraph I read this week as I was studying on the message from the complete biblical library, the study Bible from the NRV on Luke. And uh, Professor Theologian Rolf W. Harris wrote a great paragraph, and I want to break that down for you. He says this, those who believe in Christ, so if you're someone today that believes in Jesus, are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Listen to that. Those who believe, if you have faith in Jesus, you are justified, you are pardoned of your sin, freely by His grace, but God's grace through what? The redemption that is in Christ Jesus, the work that Jesus has done for us. On what basis then? On the basis of the blood of Jesus, the blood of Christ. No person can be justified by the works of the law. Okay, let's break this down. We're going to go a little deeper with that phrase. 
Justified free, freely by his grace. Let's go to Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to 24. Listen to this. Now, apart from the law, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testified. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So, hey, if you want to be in right standing with God, want to have a relationship with God, here's what you need to do. Put your faith in Jesus. This righteousness, right standing with God, is given through faith in Jesus Christ to who? To all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul saying here, hey, listen, every single one of us, whether you're Jew, whether you're Gentile, you have sinned and fallen short of God's best. Well, where did sin come from? We were born with it. In the garden, God made Adam and Eve. They were perfect. They were made in his image. They sinned. Sin was passed on to all of us. You didn't go to a class to learn how to sin, right? Come on. There was, a, there was one cookie left in the cookie jar. Mom and dad said, don't you touch that cookie. What happened? Something made you do it. And you went and you got the cookie and you ate the cookie. Why did you eat that cookie? I don't know. Something made me do it. No, it wasn't something. It's your sinful nature. And then you, the older that you get, the better you get at sinning. Right? It's in us. Why? We have all fallen short of God's glory. There's not one of us in this room can say, I have not sinned, and because I have not sinned, I am right with God. No, 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 no. We have all sinned, Paul says. All of us. We've all missed God's mark. But yes, the good news, and all are justified, pardoned, forgiven, freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Just the good news today, that if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, he has restored you into a right relationship with him. You are his son. You are his daughter. And yes, the good news, you have been redeemed. You are justified. What does that mean? It means you are pardoned. Your sin is gone. Well, on what basis? Let's go to Romans 5 verse 9. Since we have been justified, pardoned by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? What is Paul saying here? Paul's saying, hey, look. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, your sins have been forgiven. They're not covered like the Old Testament. They are removed. Why the blood of Jesus? Because Romans 6, 23 said, the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Somebody had to pay the penalty of your sin and my sin. Someone had to give their life. And it couldn't just be anybody. It had to be one who did not sin. And that person is Jesus. Because of his blood, he, once he shed his blood on the cross, he said, it is finished. What did he do? The Bible says he put his blood on the mercy seat once and for all. His blood was the atonement for all of our sins, as Hebrews chapter 2 tells us. So that's the good news for you and I today. That's why we sing that old hymn, what will wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You see, for the tax collector, what would make him whole, what would make him justified, what would make him pardoned was his works. Look at me, I'm fasting. Look at me, I'm tithing. Look at me, I'm doing all these great things. I am a great person. And what happened? Who left the temple justified? Jesus said the tax collector. Why? Because the tax collector realized, God, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. I need you to atone. I need you. There's no ways that I can fix this mess and the sin in my life. I need you, God. Now let's come on. I need you, God. And that's why Galatians 2 verse 16 says this. Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Wow. 
Doesn't matter, you can obey every law in the Bible. It will not atone for your sins. Only the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, the Pharisee made it about works and religion. The tax collector made it about relationship. God, I'm not even worthy to look at you. I'm not even worthy to talk to you. But God, could you atone? Could you, could you restore me? And that is the good news of the gospel. Now, let me tell you something. The law, Christ fulfilled the law. He didn't remove the law. See, a lot of Christians are like, well, I don't read the Old Testament. Christ, the Old Testament's done away with Jesus. All about Jesus in the New Testament. No, 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 no. The Old Testament, the law is still relevant. We're just not judged by the law anymore. We're judged by a new law called the law of grace. But the law, Christ fulfilled it. He didn't abolish it. So point one. God's grace paid the price for our salvation. Point number two, if you're taking notes, God chose us, he adopted us, he redeemed us, and guess what? He forgave us. And that's why 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we can say this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if you put your faith in Jesus, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. I love that. If I've been justified, if I've been forgiven, he chose me, he adopted me, he redeemed me, and he forgave me. I am what now? I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. But here's the problem. So many times Christians receive that. Thank you, Jesus, that you love me. Thank you, I'm like the tax collector. God, have mercy on me, and I've received the gift of salvation. But then you know what so many Christians do? Is they let the devil mess with them. So let me tell you something about the devil really quick. The devil doesn't know what you're going to do right now with the decision you're facing. He doesn't know what you're going to do with the present. He doesn't know what's going to happen in the future. See, the devil is not omniscient. What is the, what's the word omniscient mean? Omniscient means knows all things. Only God is omniscient. Only God knows the past, the present, and the future. He's the alpha, omega, beginning, and the end. God, God is omniscient. He knows all things. The devil is not. The devil doesn't know what if you're thinking about what am I going to have for lunch right now? Pizza, a burger. The devil doesn't know what you're going to do. Only God does. The devil is not omnipresent. What does that mean? Everywhere. Only God is everywhere. That's why Jesus said, hey, I am with you always. I'm with you, 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 I'm with you. Why? Because I'm omnipresent. The devil's not omnipresent. He can only be at one place at one time. Well, the devil's chasing me, pastor. No, he's not. He's going off to bigger fish than you and me. He's going to be one place at one time. He's not omnipotent. Omnipotent is the word all-powerful. Only God is all-powerful. The devil's not all-powerful. So let me tell you something about the devil. You know what the devil will do? He doesn't know what, you're going to, what decisions you're going to make right now, what you're going to make in the future. All he knows is your past. And you know what he likes to do with us, with our past? He likes to mess with us. Oh, look at you. Yeah, you were in church raising your hands, praising God, making commitments. God, I'm going to pray more. I'm going to read my word more. And guess what? Have you delivered? Nope. Yeah, look at you. Way to go. And you're like, you know what? Yeah, when am I going to get my act together? When am I going to get over this? When am I going to get over that? God, I'm so struggling. When am I going to? When am I? And you know what the devil does? He condemns you because he makes you look at the old you. I love the song we sang, the first song. I'm dancing on the grave I once was in. I'm dancing on the grave I once was in. What does that mean? Next week we're doing water baptism. The old me is in the grave. I am a new creation, justified, forgiven, righteous, all because of my works? No, all because of Jesus. And the devil hates that. And so what is he gonna do? He's gonna use your past. Oh, well, I know what you did a year ago. No one knows. I know, what, I know what you looked at this week. Yeah, you said, oh, it's the three-second rule. I looked for three seconds. Yeah, but the three seconds still sowed something into your mind. Nobody knows. But the good news is we can just be like the tax collector. God, thank you for your mercy and your grace. 
See, that's why I love Romans chapter 8, because in Romans chapter 7, Paul says, man, the things I should do, I don't. The things I shouldn't do, I do. Wretched man am I. Who could save me from this? Jesus. And then he writes such a great verse in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. What is Paul saying here? Paul is saying, I know that my flesh, I know my past. The devil wants to beat me up and mess around with me, but here's the good news. God doesn't condemn me anymore. Why? Because he's removed my sins as far as the east is from the west. What does God do now? He convicts me to be more like Jesus. He convicts me. If you're feeling condemnation in your faith journey right now, I'm going to tell you straight out, it's not Jesus that's doing that. It's the enemy. And those, those strongholds, those strongholds, the strongholds are what? The Bible says strongholds are fortified cities in your mind. Those thought patterns, that past experiences, those unresolved things. Here's my challenge to you. Put them under the blood of Jesus Christ. God, would you forgive me? Because the devil will torment you until you let the blood of Jesus wash it away. God, you've chosen me. You've adopted me. I'm your child. You've redeemed me and you've forgiven me. Don't let the devil beat you up. Point number three is faith is our action in receiving this grace. Faith is our action in receiving this grace. Rick Warren says this. He says, what gives me the most hope every day is God's grace. Knowing that his grace is going to give me the strength for whatever I face. Knowing that nothing is a surprise to God. No matter what I'm going to go through today, God is, God's grace is going to give me the strength to get through it. His grace is new. His mercies are new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. Even when I'm not, He's faithful. And I'm going to do life. I'm, by faith, I'm receiving this grace. I'm opening up my hands. You see, there's some of you today, you're holding on to, well, I'm going to get my act together. Guess what? I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to be a better Christian, and, and I'm going to work harder, and I'm going to, I'm going to just like, I'm going to, I'm going to fast two times a day, and I'm going to tithe, and I'm, I'm tired of everything, even the air. I'm going, to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to read. I'm going to, I'm going to do, 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 instead of just be. And we've got to, you know, to receive God's grace, sometimes you've got to get, let go of the things you've been holding on to. Say, God, my hands are open. I don't have anything. You see what I love about the tax collector when he said, be merciful to me? Hales Kamai, what was he saying? God, I cannot atone for my sin. I need you. And sometimes in faith, faith is, you want a, a simple definition of faith? A simple definition of faith is, God, I don't know what to do. But all I'm choosing to do is trust you. How does God trust you? I don't know how you're going to get me out of this. I don't know how I'm going to find my healing. I don't know how I'm going to get my peace. But all I know is that's your job. My job is to let go and to trust you. Faith is our action in receiving this grace. And the last point, point number four, works flow out of salvation. Works don't save you. Our works don't save us. Works flow out of salvation. Works don't save us. Religion doesn't save you. Now, Paul does say, faith without works is dead. But notice the order. Faith without works. Faith comes before works. So Paul is saying, don't think, well, hey, just, okay, Jesus, thank you for forgiving me. I receive that. I'm a child of God. I'm adopted. So I'm chosen. I'm adopted. I'm redeemed. I'm forgiven. That's awesome. And, um, okay, I'm just going to sit around. No, 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 no. Paul says, now... Because you're a child of God, go and bear fruit. Now works flow out of what God has done in me. But works don't save me. See, we forget it's not religion God wants. It's relationship. 